40 or so participants. Um, I think we're okay to get started. Larry and Justin, if that feels good to you. Yeah, and let me just jump in. Thank you, Madeline. Yeah. And thanks everybody for participating and particularly thank you to Justin. I see a question from Elaine French, Madeline, about can folks who are on here see, see who else is you signed on, and I don't know if you're able to answer that. Uh, I don't believe there is a way, Elaine, unfortunately. Um, I think it's all private. Okay, so sorry about that, Elaine. And I do want to welcome Justin. I just want to say that I've known Justin for quite a long time now. We have worked together since really before he joined Idaho Conservation League, back when he worked with, I believe it was American Rivers, and maybe even way back when he interned, I believe, with Idaho Rivers United. And uh, so I am a little bit uh, older than Justin, been around longer, watched him come up, watched him move up. Uh, and for years, as he was the program director at Idaho Conservation League, we really worked closely a lot on a lot of cases. And now, as everyone knows, I hope that uh, Justin has succeeded uh, Rick Johnson at the Idaho Conservation League. And uh, not only has he done a great job of, of stepping into Rick's shoes, but it's come at a time that really is historic in terms of Idaho salmon and steelhead, just in terms of the, pol the political moment, the opportunity here to, to address something, uh, a very major threat to Idaho salmon and steelhead, the Lower Snake River dams, and the voice that this is coming from, Representative Mike Simpson from Idaho. I think most people probably know that um, Representative Simpson uh, worked hard over many years to put together what we call the Boulder White Clouds Wilderness Bill from 2015, and Idaho Conservation League was a key partner uh, with Representative Simpson in that. I know that uh, the congressman's staff has had a lot of detailed discussions with lots of people around the state and the region, but Idaho Conservation League has been one of the most important voices in talking with them about the ideas you're going to hear about tonight. I do think this is a tremendous moment and uh, really appreciate, Justin, you spending time with us. And what we're going to do is start off with, Justin's going to take us through the elements of Representative Simpson's proposal then he and I are going to have a short dialogue back and forth a little bit about really what does that mean for advocates for the West Fork and Idaho Conservation League's uh, uh, litigation. Uh, and, and then we're going to open it up for more questions. So as you have questions, please do go ahead and type them in. We will have plenty of time at the end, but Justin, I'm going to turn it over to you and, and thanks again for being here. Thank you, Laird, and thank you to everyone uh, for tuning in this evening. It's uh, this is an issue that I really care a lot about, and I know that you all do as well. So uh, thanks for spending time with me. Um, before I share my screen and go through a couple slides, just to um, orientate folks towards the, the scope of the Simpson proposal, um, I do want to uh, speak a little bit about um, sort of the ICL's relationship with Congressman Simpson. Um, Many of you names I recognize um, in the panelists there that I can see on my side. You've been to uh, Wild Idaho. You've worked closely with ICL and Advocates for the West for years on this issue and others. Um, and you've seen uh, the passion that Mike Simpson has when he speaks about wild places in Idaho. And you saw uh, how he worked for over 10 years to protect um, an area that's really important to him and to many other Idahoans, uh, the Boulder White Clouds as wilderness. And um, you know, the proposal that we're gonna talk about today does uh, three things, I think. Um, and the Simpson office has said that they hope that it, if it comes to be something like it comes to be, it will accomplish three things. And one of those things is it will restore salmon and steelhead in Idaho. And the other thing that it will do, and this is very important to the Simpson office, is that it will um, make the communities of Idaho whole and people will be uh, kept whole or made better off as a result of the passage of a proposal like this. And then the third component that, that he said he wants to, to do is he wants to end the salmon wars. And I think all of us have a different notion of whether there is or isn't even a salmon war going on and what it might look like from our perspective. Uh, but that, those are the three things that, that I think are sort of anchoring his proposal. So we'll talk about all of them. Um, as I've spent time talking uh, across the region with colleagues uh, and peers and other organizations and congressional offices, um, folks wanna know why Simpson cares so much about salmon. 
um, you know, his proposal was uh, something that I, I think made sense to many of us who live in Idaho and have seen him as a strong conservationist on public lands issues for a long time. But for people outside of Idaho who are not familiar with Congressman Simpson, uh, I think that they were surprised to see such a comprehensive and bold proposal come out of a pretty conservative state and from someone who is a pretty conservative member of Congress. And it's my understanding that years ago, uh, Mike Simpson and his wife uh, stood on the banks of Marsh Creek and they saw at that time one returning salmon to spawn. And they were there with folks um, who, who brought them to that spot because it would be a spot where they would likely see salmon. Congressman Simpson wanted uh, to learn more about salmon. And uh, in my discussions with, with him, it, it became clear to me that he learned so much about the special areas in central Idaho through his work to protect the boulder white clouds. And he realized that he'd protected an incredible landscape, but creating a wilderness area does not necessarily ensure that the important species that call that wilderness area home uh, are protected along with that wilderness. And it became apparent to him that although the landscape had been protected, uh, the salmon that made that landscape so incredibly special were not protected necessarily. Uh, merely by having a wilderness area designated. So I think that is sort of the beginning of his journey to learn more about salmon and to think about ways that his office could play a role in protecting them, restoring them. And then that needed to connect in his mind, I think, with the importance of people in his district and the communities throughout the Northwest. Um, so the proposal that we're going to walk through tonight, I think, is the logical outgrowth of that. And I will uh, underscore that at this point, it's just a proposal. These are his ideas. Uh, you know, many of you have probably seen a video that he put out uh, about four minute video a little over a month ago where he describes the creation of this proposal. And at that point, he said he'd talked to over 300 folks, uh, organizations uh, to build this proposal. I ICL was fortunate to be uh, one of the groups that he asked questions and listened to our opinions on. But this proposal was built uh, from, you know, input from people all across the state and across the region. And it's really Mike Simpson's proposal. Uh, so with that, I'm going to share my screen. Um, and Laird, since I can still see you, um, hang on, it's not going for me. There we go. Can you give me a thumbs up that you can see that? Yep. Okay. Uh, so uh, Congressman Simpson calls this proposal the Northwest in Transition. And I think that that name, while it does sound a little clunky, it's actually really quite accurate. He is observing uh, that th change is coming in the Northwest with regard to salmon, with regard to many of the other things that are captured in his proposal. And so the Northwest is transitioning from uh, where we are today, which is largely built on things uh, and reliant on things that were created in the past. And where does the Northwest want to go? What do we want our future to look like? So he's calling his proposal uh, the Northwest in transition. Uh, I want to start by just saying the, the cornerstone of this proposal is something called the Columbia Basin Fund. Uh, this is a, a bucket of resources that would be fully appropriated if it came to pass. Uh, he is proposing that it be funded with $33.5 billion uh, and that it would be administered uh, by uh, a Senate approved appointee who would then direct funding to accomplish the many things that are outlined in the proposal or any future piece of legislation that captures all this. So the idea is that uh, the region would receive funding to do all this work and it would receive all that funding up front uh, so that the region could know that this work will happen and it can't be held hostage five years from now to uh, you know, the changing, um, you know, the fickle mind of appropriators who might decide to stop this. So it's, it's sort of an all in moment if it were to happen. Uh, for the Idaho Conservation League, the cornerstone of this is the salmon recovery part, right? So um, the removal of the four Lower Snake River dams uh, comes in at about $1.4 billion. It's just taken out the earthen portions of the dams. For those of you who have seen these projects, you recognize that about two thirds of the dam is concrete. There's the powerhouse, there's the navigation lock, and then there's an earthen portion and you would just remove the earthen portion. He's got dates here, uh, 2030 to 2031. Um, 
and you know there's sediment backed up behind the dams uh, that needs to be taken care of or accommodated in some way. There is some concern that if you remove the reservoirs, the way in which the soils are saturated would dry out and that might cause adjacent parallel roads and uh, railways to slope a little bit. So there's a stabilization fund for that. Uh, $75 million as part of the restoration to replant the corridor, if you will. You know, if you draw down these reservoirs, uh, when you first see them, they will be sort of muddy and silty banks, but over time, plants will grow back. And so we want to speed that along and make sure that good habitat is, is replanted. Um, and then when these reservoirs are drawn down, uh, things that are currently underwater will be on the surface again. And that'll be the first time in 50 years. And so the tribes have signaled that there are many areas that are culturally very significant to them. And they want to make sure that they are protected as they are re-exposed and people might start paying visits to them again. So there's a fund here for that too. So all in the components for the dam removal part come to about $2.3 billion. And if you, you know, look, think back a little bit, I said that the, the fund in total would be $33.5 billion. So only a small portion of the money uh, that's imagined as part of this proposal is really for dam removal. And I think that, that is what makes this proposal so very different than anything else that the region has ever seen, is that um, salmon recovery through dam removal is a key part of this, but is really kind of a small part in terms of the infrastructure and investment that the Northwest would see as this advances. <clears throat> the biggest single part in this is actually energy replacement, and that comes in at $16 billion. $10 billion of that would be to replace the energy uh, lost when the four lower Snake River dams are actually removed. So, you know, these dams, they do make electricity. Um, and Simpson has said that if the dams come out, that energy needs to re be replaced. Uh, he'd like it to be firm power, uh, clean power, renewables, batteries, other sorts of energy sources. He has signaled a preference for small modular nuclear reactors. Um, that shouldn't be a surprise to anyone that that's something that he considers a viable solution. His district includes the Idaho National Lab, which is a cornerstone of research out there, and then also energy efficiency measures. Four billion for what's called salmon spill replacement energy. And while four dams are coming out, all the other dams in the basin are staying, all the big federal dam, the mainstream dams, like the lower Columbia projects, but they'll be operated differently. They'll be operated in a more fish friendly way. And so, um, uh, you know, if you spill more water over the spillways of those dams for fish, that means less water goes to the powerhouse. And so less energy will be generated. So you need a replacement energy sources created to offset the lost energy through operational changes at lower dams. So that's coming at about 4 billion. And then here's 2 billion for transmission system upgrades, essentially. And so the Northwest transmission system is woefully inadequate for our current needs. But if you go and spend $16 billion on new renewable sources of energy distributed across the Pacific Northwest, uh, we're gonna to need to make sure that we have a more robust infrastructure to connect them so that that system works better in the future. So uh, 16 billion is the energy replacement component here. Um, agriculture is another key community that the Simpson office has said that they need to ensure uh, uh, remains whole or is made better by this. Um, while the four lower Snake River dams don't store water for irrigation and aren't big flood control projects like we're used to seeing um, in southern Idaho, uh, there is some irrigation that takes place primarily at the Ice Harbor Dam, which is the furthest downstream of these four dams. Uh, if the reservoir was drawn down, the current irrigation infrastructure down there for those farms would be left sort of high and dry because it's all arrayed towards the pool elevation of a full reservoir. And so $750 million is being allocated here towards uh, mitigating the effects on the irrigation infrastructure. That basically means you know, new pumps, controlling sediment, extending pipes, that kind of thing. This is to ensure that farms that are in the area around Ice Harbor that rely on irrigation from Ice Harbor um, are not uh, harmed by this effort. And then of course, uh, transportation happening on the Lower Snake River uh, is very important primarily to barge traffic for wheat. Uh, wheat is by far the largest commodity that's, that's on the waterway. Um, it's a low cost alternative. It's an efficient system for the folks who currently use it. If it were to be removed, uh, they shouldn't be left holding the bag, if you will. 
And so Simpson is proposing a 1.5 billion in improved transportation network. Uh, that's largely improving rail. There's some road work in there and there's some storage capacity stuff there. Um, there's also 1.5 here for shippers and handlers and port facility adjustments. Uh, the current system is constructed largely on the presumption that the waterway will stay there. So, you know, loading facilities are pointed towards the waterway. And if the waterway is gone, you need to reconfigure them so they're loading rail cars. Uh, so there's money in here for that. And then, like I said, while the four lower Snake River dams are being breached and removed, uh, the four lower Columbia River dams stay. So barge traffic can continue on the lower Columbia. And there's uh, $1.2 billion here to ensure that that uh, is done well and remains efficient for folks. In fact, as in, is improved. 600 million of that goes to the Tri-Cities port area uh, to make that area a more significant intermodal uh, transportation hub. And then there's 600 million here for improvements to the lower Columbia navigation system. Uh, you know, those locks uh, have maintenance needs. There's some dredging needs that have, um, that have not been tended to. And then another component that's very important in this proposal is uh, the economic health of the communities that are adjacent to the waterway or most affected uh, by the removal of the dams and the drawdown of these reservoirs. You know, obviously, uh, Lewiston Clarkston is sort of at the head of the waterway, uh, straddling the border between Idaho and Washington. They would be affected by this. Uh, there's one, uh, 150 million here to help Lewiston Clarkston uh, redevelop a new waterfront. Right now, they look out over a reservoir when that reservoir is gone. How do they want their community to, to embrace and react to a free flowing river and what should that look like? Uh, so there's money there for that. Also, uh, the proposal here includes $1.25 billion for economic development in the form of something that Simpson is calling the Snake River Center for Advanced Energy Storage. Um, that is like a research park for partnership between federal, uh, private, and university research centers largely taking up the mission of uh, energy storage and future energy storage needs uh, by the world, really, as we think about how do we transition away from fossil fuels and what sort of battery and other storage technologies do we need. And then uh, economic development and compensation funds here, uh, 875 million. Uh, there's some stuff in here that is very specific to individual industries. So the Clearwater paper mill, for instance, uh, in the Lewiston area, if the reservoir was drawn down, uh, there needs to be some re-engineering and rebuilding in their structures uh, so that they can continue to operate. Um, so that's kind of a big ticket item in here. And just to show you how detailed this is, there's also $50 million buried in here uh, to help boat owners. Many people who live in the Lewiston Clarks area have bought water ski boats on the presumption that there would be a reservoir for them to water ski on. And if the reservoir went away, Simpson wants to make sure that they're not holding the price of a boat um, that they can't use anymore. So there's a fund in here for that. So the, the things that the Simpson office has thought about with regard to economic development and mitigation and compensation are pretty extensive. And then I'll also just flag uh, that this proposal would designate uh, the river that will be reborn when these reservoirs are drawn down as a new national recreation area. It'll be about 140 miles long, and that will be something that'll be jointly managed by the tribes and the Bureau of Land Management. And it's seen as a, as a likely uh, significant increase in recreational opportunities uh, and economic development associated with that. The next component here uh, relates to the Bonneville Power Administration. Uh, for folks who have been watching this issue for some number of years, you're all very familiar with the fact that the Bonneville Power Administration is in financial trouble. Um, the region uh, is probably going to take steps to protect Bonneville, to increase Bonneville's financial strength. The things that the Bonneville Power Administration has said is important to them is they need an increase in their borrowing capacity from the Treasury. So right now they can borrow about $7.7 .7 billion and this proposal would increase it to 15. Um, right now also the Bonneville Power Administration have annually pays uh, most of the fish mitigation costs that are happening in the hydro system. And the growing nature of that uh, expense through time is something that's fairly threatening to Bonneville and ratepayers. Uh, so 
This proposes to cap the responsibility that they would have at $600 million a year. And then also importantly, it removes Bonneville from uh, direct fish management responsibilities. Right now, Bonneville Power Administration calls a lot of the shots about how you're gonna restore salmon and what sort of stuff is gonna get funded in the basin. And you know, quite frankly, this is a bit of a conflict of interest for them. Uh, they make money by making electricity. The dams are killing the fish. Uh, that's sort of an infinite to-do loop right there. And so getting them out of direct management of fish uh, is an important component of advancing salmon recovery in the region. And then also as BPA uh, is taken out of fish management, tribes and states are elevated forward in a new and powerful way. So a new wild, uh, fish and wildlife council would be created where Northwest, tribe, Northwest states and the tribes would be co-equals uh, and they would make the funding decisions. They would be the entity that allocates that $600 million a year of BPA funding that's capped there uh, on projects. And then in addition to the annual $600 million expenditures that they would direct, uh, the, the Simpson proposal uh, has $2.3 billion in sort of seed money for other projects that are important to states and tribes. Significant in here uh, is money for lamprey passage. Uh, folks who are familiar with the Snake and Columbia River system, you know, recognize that while salmon and steelhead are in steep decline, so are lamprey and their needs are a little different than salmon at steelhead. And lamprey have not been the focus of much of the recovery effort and spending so far because they're actually not listed as an endangered species. Uh, so there's money in here for lamprey, there's money in here for sturgeon, and there's also significant funding in here to help uh, states and tribes work together to put fish back into block areas. So for instance, um, you know, fish turning into the Snake River system, they can't get past the Hell's Canyon project. Fish swimming up the mid-Columbia, they can't get past uh, Chief Joe and Grant Cooley. So there's funding in here to work with states and tribes to put fish above those areas. That doesn't mean that the ESA protected species would be reintroduced above those, those barriers, but it means that fish uh, would be moved back up there and they would serve those ecological and, and um, harvest ceremonial and subsistence purposes. And then there's a really big component of this plan that deals with water quality uh, across the entire region. So Simpson proposes to create $3 billion of funding for watershed partnerships spread around the region. Uh, these are voluntary efforts that would work primarily on non-points uh, sources of pollution. So like agricultural runoff and things like that. There's uh, 700 million in this current proposal for Snake River. This is the mid-snake stretch. This is the Snake River that flows through Southern Idaho. Uh, there's 300 million for the Willamette. There's 800 million for the Columbia. 600 million for Puget Sound. And of course, Puget Sound is not in the Snake and Columbia River Basin, but it's a signal of how important water quality is for fisheries issues and how it's important that this proposal have something for the entire region. And since the Puget Sound area isn't in um, the mix for the salmon that move up and down the Columbia, there's funding in here for water quality in the Puget Sound. And the same is true with Washington Coast and Oregon Coast, and then Montana as well. So there's funding to address needs for water quality, largely from agricultural impacts uh, across the basin. Um, and then there's an additional 1.6 million here for agricultural waste management. Agricultural waste management is just a fancy way for saying how you deal with manure. And for folks in Southern Idaho, you recognize that we have a pretty serious manure problem. And that one of the big things that's harming the mid snake uh, is all the manure and nutrients that are getting into that. And so each of the four, the three states, Idaho, Washington, and Oregon would receive $400 million um, of incentives for ensuring that manure gets handled better. In the current proposal, a pretty significant chunk of this money is earmarked for methane digesters. And methane digesters um, would be a, a good start for handling manure in better and more responsible ways. And it would also help us address climate change by harvesting the methane out of this manure so it doesn't get into the atmosphere. Um, and also it's a good source of firm renewable energy, right? Wind and solar are incredibly important sources of energy as we move forward to meet our needs, but they are intermittent in nature. Uh, methane digesters are firm power. So here's a component of renewable that's firm. 
And then in addition to the 1.2 million that would be uh, for each of these three states for on the ground projects, there's 400 million in here for um, research grants to universities and that's universities in Idaho, Oregon, Washington, and Montana. Uh, and then lastly, and I think somewhat controversially uh, for the environmental community uh, is a component in here that the Simpson office has uh, related to uh, what I called earlier, ending the salmon wars. And so uh, Mike Simpson sees the salmon wars largely related uh, to litigation. And so he is proposing certainty uh, for dams that remain. So here you can see these bullets. He's proposing a 35 year moratorium on salmon and steelhead litigation at most of the remaining federal dams and many private dams in the systems. So um, the four lower snakes come out, but other dams that make up the Columbia River hydro system remain, and they have uh, a 35 year moratorium on ESA related litigation. Um, this is controversial. Um, and then there are many private dams in the basin that have FERC licenses, they generate electricity. Um, and so he is proposing that they would get license extensions. Uh, they could receive a 35 year license extension and the 35 license extension combined with the existing term on their license uh, could be no more than 50 years. So they have a, quite a bit of certainty here for years to come. This does not uh, absolve them of their need to meet their legal obligations under their existing FERC licenses and permits and other sort of operating things. Uh, it is an extension of their license. Um, and um, there's a little bit of uncertainty in the Simpson proposal about what sort of litigation moratorium they might experience as well or have access to. Uh, but the main part of this uh, is the FERC license extension. Um, a big part of opposition to dam removal of this scale of the four lower snakes um, has been, if you remove these dams, what's next? You're stepping out onto a slippery slope. And you know people have said, if you allow these four dams to be removed, then suddenly people will try and take out Hell's Canyon or they'll try and take out the lower Columbia projects. So a big part of this certainty effort, uh, as I see it from the Simpson office, is to address this question of the slippery slope argument that opponents have raised through time. So while certain dams are coming out, certain dams are being given certainty that they will stay. And even though uh, certainty is being given that dams uh, whose operators want them to stay, uh, it's also very apparent that there are many projects in the basin, dams in the basin, uh, where the owners are open to removing them voluntarily or actually would like to remove them because they're no longer serving a useful purpose, but maybe they don't have the funding to do so. So uh, while certainty is provided for dams, there's also a significant fund created for the voluntary removal of dams. And then there's also a significant fund created here uh, to address liability. We've seen that there are instances where dam owners wanna remove dams, but actually they can't for legal liability sort of insurance coverage reasons. Uh, so uh, this slide here captures uh, the components of his proposal about dam certainty uh, and slippery slope arguments, uh, but also this notion that some dams are still gonna keep coming out in the basin uh, because the, the owners will, will want to remove them. Um, lastly, I just wanna sort of end on some of the, the thinking about this. Um, this is a really comprehensive proposal uh, and it's likely to continue to change. I don't think that this is its final form by any stretch. In fact, I, I hope it's not. I think that there are many things that can be improved in this. And I think that there are some things that the Simpson office didn't think about that others will bring to him, hopefully, uh, which will result in modifications, hopefully, which make this a better proposal from all parties' perspectives. One thing that's really clear, though, is that the Simpson office is trying to give the region the resources uh, to chart its own destiny, to create its own path forward. Right. So if you spend $33.5 billion on energy and agriculture, transportation and water quality and salmon recovery and community investment, uh, that opens up a lot of opportunities and it puts many of these Northwest communities in charge of their own future. And so um, in closing, I'll just say that I think this really is a once in a lifetime opportunity. Um, and I encourage folks uh, to look pretty critically at this at this proposal. There's a lot of good stuff in here. There's some things that, that cause concern, uh, justifiably cause some concern. 
And we're looking forward to working with uh, the Simpson office as this continues to evolve, but we're also looking forward to working with other members of the congressional delegation, both in Idaho and those in Oregon and Washington to try and bring their interests into this more closely, um, have an opportunity for them uh, to be part of creating a proposal that delivers on all of these things, that gets us abundant salmon and steelhead in the region, but that maintains the region's agricultural economy, that creates new opportunities for reliable and affordable clean energy, um, that honors the commitments that our nation has made and continually broken to Northwest tribes, and that strengthens communities and local economies across the region. Um, so I'll, I'll end the presentation with that and I'll stop sharing the screen, Laird, and I'll invite you back in and see if there's some questions that we could we could tackle. Wow, that's great. Thank you so much, Justin, for that quick overview. It really is a complicated proposal. And in my mind, it's really impressive in the scope. Like what, what you say about making communities whole and as a regional approach that's looking at not only salmon and steelhead, but energy. Uh, what, what will our energy future look like? And what would the economies of Idaho, Oregon, and Washington look like with a re restored Lower Snake River? And I love the idea of a national recreation area there. But there, there, we want to drill down a bit into uh, what this really means, I think, for you know, advocates for the West and the work we do. We, of course, are free lawyers that uh, go to court to enforce these environmental laws. And there's not a lot of precedent for a litigation moratorium, much less for ending litigation wars. There was the analogy of the spotted owl, the Northwest spotted owl, uh, and the Pacific uh, Northwest old growth uh, controversies that, that erupted in the 80s and the early 90s. And that was maybe the most comparable sort of broad regional solution that I can remember seeing. And that resulted in the election of Bill Clinton coming in, convening a Northwest forest planning group, instructions from the president to agency scientists to come up with a plan to save the old growth forest of the Pacific Northwest and a whole plan. And it's had lots of issues, but that, that was a political directive from on high. Here we have in a bitterly divided partisan, politically partisan time, a, a proposal coming from a conservative Idaho Republican to, to do all these things. And what, what is it gonna take? Well, we'll get to some of the specifics on what does the ending the wars mean and all of that in litigation, uh, but, but what does it take for this to get passed? What is the, the future for this proposal now? And in particular, a, what's the role of the Pacific Northwest elected representatives, governors, and congressionals? And B, what will be the role of the Biden administration? How do you see that playing out? And how do you think Representative Simpson sees that playing out? Yeah, um, so I, I think that obviously this proposal and you know, it points to the congressman's desire and, and feeling that what we need is a congressional solution. We need to pass legislation essentially and we need appropriate money to do it. Uh, others might disagree. I've heard lots of arguments that we don't actually need an act of Congress to do this sort of thing, but we do need an act of Congress to appropriate money. And so uh, the, the obvious goal here is to get something that gets regional support and national support to advance, uh, to address all these questions. And it seems unlikely that this is something that's going to move if it's just one side using a cudgel to beat the other side into submission. So this is truly a grand compromise. Um, and I think that explains why it's so big, frankly. Um, you know, there are things in here that folks all across the region both want and hate. And so, you know, if you're um, you know, Southern Idaho agriculture, uh, you're worried perennially about will you have enough water for your crops and you want to do whatever you can do or be part of doing to ensure that you have sort of sovereign control over Idaho water and certainty for use. So there's a thing in here for that. And there's a comfort in this proposal for those interests. Similarly, I think that those interests probably have always reacted negatively to and opposed the notion of dam removal. 
Uh, you know, the slippery slope argument certainly is of concern to them, but also there is this notion, I'm sure, of wanting to support kindred spirits in like industries across the region and not be, you know, pitted against each other. And so they've always hung together. And so this proposal has, you know, no one is being made worse off by this proposal if it happens the way that it's imagined. Uh, so people are free to sort of talk about that and see what ag downstream needs. And you've got irrigators who are being taken care of with that fund to extend pipes in Ice Harbor. And you've got, um, you know, grain transportation moving from waterway to rail. So people are, are going to be made whole that way. So if the region is gonna look at this, they're gonna say, okay, no one's being thrown under the bus. And I like this part of this big package for me. So, you know, if I'm Southern Idaho agriculture, I probably say, I don't like dam removal, but I like water certainty. I like water quality funding. I like, I like the components of this. I like stabilizing my electricity rates. So I can move hopefully forward for this package, even though I might object to individual components of it. So that same sort of thinking I think can be flipped. So they got the conservation community. You know, I like the dam removal component of this. I like the money for salmon. I like the money for water quality. I like the money for, and um, you know, interest in clean renewable energy transmission. But I, I'm, I'm uncomfortable with the idea of waiving laws and creating moratoriums on litigation and uncertainty about that. So can I be made confident that all the good stuff that's coming in here, water quality funding, salmon recovery funding, energy funding, is that sufficient? Is that going to address the region's concerns from an environmental front? Or do we need to rely on litigation still for something that, that, that's, that's coming or we don't know about? I think that's an open question. And I think that that's likely to be the thing that many folks in the environmental community have to grapple with. Um, you know, I, I've heard some folks say that, you know, in, in a big compromise, nobody gets everything that they want. And I think that the Simpson proposal, you know, illustrates that point exactly. I, I certainly don't think that the Idaho Conservation League gets everything that we would imagine we would like to see advance. And similarly, I can imagine, um, you know, folks who are traditionally on the other side of the table on this, they absolutely don't like a lot of the stuff that's moving forward in this proposal, uh, but they probably do find value in like many of the other components. So there's a lot to, and I appreciate folks' questions coming in, and I'm going to be trying to articulate some of them. A lot of them are consistent with the questions I want to ask. Um, you know, tangibly, how does this move forward? Like it's, the proposal's been out for what, six or eight weeks now. And there was a recent article, I believe, in E&E &E News saying uh, the response from the Pacific Northwest congressional delegations in the three states has been crickets. We know that in Idaho, our elected congressionals have indicated opposition, as has Governor Little. Um, a, I, you know, I, I don't know that you can answer these and you were talking about it before, but why do folks in Idaho who are going to be getting a lot of money out of this oppose the removal of dams in, in, in the state of Washington? But B, in particular, where do the uh, Washington state senators, um, Patty Murray and Maria Cantwell stand? And what do you know about what's going on with negotiations between congressional offices and, and talking that may not be out visible in, in the public? Yeah. So, uh, you know, this proposal was made public by the Simpson office, uh, I think at midnight on a Saturday night on, you know, early February. But of course, you know, in talking to 300 different organizations over a two year period to try and build this thing, a lot of people kind of knew something was coming and they, um, so, so word that this was coming was on the street before this thing was actually on the street. And you started seeing it kind of reaching a fever pitch, you know, on the Thursday or Friday before the big planned announcement, people were already putting out press statements. No, hell no. Yes, it's the greatest thing ever. And people were responding to something that they, they hadn't even seen, I think, largely in detail. And, you know, ICL included, we hadn't seen it. So we were kind of holding fire because we wanted to see it before we said what we thought about it. Um, but... I think that speaks to the fact that people in the Northwest who have been focusing on this issue on either side of this for a long time, think that they know the answer to the question before the question gets asked. You know, and the question has historically been, do you or do you not support dam removal? And that's a pretty easy one for people to know their answer to a long time ago. 
But the Simpson proposal is so much more than dam removal. So I think we saw a lot of knee jerk reactions that were kind of urgent and immediate. And then you of course sort of seeing that echo in the machine still where uh, people are still saying, you know, whether it's an Idaho congressional office or a legislator, they're saying no to something, but they frankly don't necessarily know what they're saying no to. Or on the other side, people may not know what they're saying yes to. This is an incredibly uh, comprehensive proposal. And there are really few details in the material that the Simpson office has released. So if you go to the Simpson webpage, there's a whole section there on this proposal. There's many documents you can read and there is not a lot of detail. So there, there is no plan to actually replace the waterway with a rail system that's as efficient. There's a promise to do so, but there's no, there's no, this is how you do it. So people are very uncomfortable with saying, you know, agricultural interests will support this because we see that it's gonna be just great for us because you just can't look at details. So there's kind of a, now that this is out, people are invited into the discussion and so we're certainly trying to telegraph our thoughts back into the Simpson office about this. And I think with other people as well, but many people felt compelled to state their definitive and currently known position. I oppose this or I support this. And a lot of very interesting discussions are now happening sort of out of the limelight and behind the scenes where people are really digging into this and they're saying, wow, you know, for $3 billion, we could really have a very different looking transportation system for grain in the Pacific Northwest, a transportation system that actually would not make us captive to the market prices at the mouth of the Columbia River, a transportation system that would allow us to take our grain to Tacoma or you know, east. You can't go upstream further than Lewiston in a barge. So you know, a rail system is different and people need to think about the implications for that. And so I think some very interesting discussions are happening, whether it's on the power front, transportation front, ag front, water front, the litigation certainty front, all of these things are really starting to happen. And nobody has really signaled a change in position yet. And I don't think that's likely to, to be happening in the near future. Uh, but some very interesting discussions are happening behind the scenes. And I'm hopeful that as the Simpson proposal continues to advance, people will step into it and say, here's my ideas on how you make it better so that it, it really works for me. So just to be clear, I mean, my understanding is there is no draft legislation. Nobody has put pen to paper to say, here's what we would do in terms of enacting federal law or changing federal laws, including the litigation moratorium. Is that right? There's no, no draft yet? I don't believe there's a draft. Uh, I, I've certainly not seen one. I, I can tell you actually that in our conversations with um, other members of Congress from across the region, they're saying they want to see a draft. Yeah. And I think that's interesting because the Simpson office has said, well, we didn't draft one because we knew if we drafted one, you'd just, you know, you'd dig through it and you'd see details you didn't like. And then we'd be, you know, at loggerheads over a detail. Let's work together to create those details. Let's work together to draft it. So there's this sort of funny chicken and egg problem where people are like angry that there's no details and say they want a draft, but then would be very upset if the draft didn't say exactly what they wanted it to say. Well, I think we've seen with the Biden administration already with the 1.9, I believe it was, trillion stimulus package that a very narrowly divided Senate approved uh, in contrast to the Obama years where President Obama tried to water down stimulus um, funding to satisfy Republican objections and it didn't really work. And here Biden just went ahead with it. And now we all know, I believe another 1.9 trillion infrastructure bill is in the works. What I've heard is probably August, September is when that may move. Um, you know, 33.5 billion for Representative Simpson's proposal sounds like a lot, but it doesn't sound like very much in the middle of a 1.9 trillion proposal. What's, what's the likelihood of this being in a shape to be included in that infrastructure bill? Is that the path that's gonna happen? And and, and maybe a little harder edge to that, what's to stop the Democrats from taking the good things they like out of Simpson's proposal? After all, tax and spend Democrats love to throw money at something. Let's throw the 33 billion out, but not have the litigation moratorium. And let's assume that taking out dams and improving all these systems will resolve the salmon wars because we will actually be restoring salmon. Do you think that's a possibility that the Democrats could actually take parts of this idea and run with it and, 
and run it through legislation? Uh, there was a whole bunch of questions there. I'll try and, and, and hit them all. But feel Sorry. free to, 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 to rewind me and be like, you forgot that part. Um, so uh, it was clearly in an, a hope uh, by all of us, frankly, uh, who, are, who are in support of something like this, you know, moving from proposal phase to, to legislation phase, that the um, infrastructure package that's being created in Congress and, you know, being advocated by, by the Biden administration, that that would be a vehicle for this. And um, nobody really knows when that's going to happen. I mean, is it, is it two months? Is it six months? I don't think people know. Uh, the longer this, re th this proposal um, sort of hangs out there in its current form and doesn't start getting, you know, members of Congress from Democrat and Republican side sort of participating in this discussion, the less likely we are to actually be able to write bill language. Um, Simpson has said pretty pointedly he needs dancing partners, as he calls them, from across the region to put together ideas in his proposal and other things into bill text, which could then be captured in the infrastructure package. So that's still goal one from my perspective, but as we get closer to whatever the deadline is that we don't actually know when the deadline is for when that vehicle might move, it, you know, it gets harder to imagine that you can write 200 pages of legislation that addresses everyone's needs if you only have 24 hours to do it. So there does come a point where you're like, okay, we're not gonna be able to have all of this comprehensive proposal in there. And so about a week ago, Simpson said he was open to other ideas. And one of the other ideas that he floated was, what if the infrastructure and spending bill that moves forward uh, contains full appropriation of funds for the Columbia Basin Fund, but doesn't direct how that money will be spent? Is this an opportunity to fund the work, even as you continue to have you know, lack of details or lack of clarity around what the actual work is? So that's another option that he signaled. Uh, there are other things also happening across the region. You can imagine a standalone piece of legislation perhaps, or you could imagine some larger collaborative effort. For me, uh, being in the infrastructure package would be the best path. It becomes less likely the closer we get to that deadline. Using it as a funding vehicle is a second best path. And so we'll try and, and see how that all works out. Um, and I'm sorry, I've kind of spaced on what the last part of your question was. <laughs> no, you're, you're doing great. And I'm going to be getting into some more specifics, including some of the questions coming out here. So re realizing that the legislation is not drafted, we don't really know what it would look like. The notion of ending the salmon wars, having a litigation moratorium, extending FERC licenses, what, what are there going to be the dividing lines there? For instance, you've mentioned no ESA litigation over the major dams. Does that only mean anadromous fish, salmon and steelhead? What will happen with Idaho's bull trout populations, which are also listed under the Endangered Species Act? Of course, they're threatened by the Lower Snake River dams as well, but they're threatened by a lot of other things up in the headwaters. Would, would not anadromous fish somehow be exempted as well, do you think? Lord, I think that's a great question. And I'm just gonna go back to what I said earlier, which is the proposal that's on the table is really scant on details. And the language that's in the proposal does say uh, anadromous fish related litigation. So bull trout wouldn't necessarily be part of that and neither would sturgeon. Uh, but um, I, I think that people need to come together and, and talk more about this. I think that Simpson's notion of ending the salmon wars is probably very different than uh, what someone who is on the Willamette or on the coast might mean when they think about salmon wars. And so, you know, the proposal that Simpson has put out, he feels very strongly about. And I, I saw some chat go by here a minute ago that they mentioned the mailer that Simpson had mailed out where it's clear that he is really prioritizing this notion of litigation uh, moratoriums and, and ESA certainty. Um, so he feels pretty strongly about that, obviously. But I don't necessarily know that that's actually a solution that ends any sort of salmon wars in areas where there aren't hydro system questions. So a one size fits all approach as envisioned by Mike Simpson might not really be what the region wants. Mike Simpson might be able to articulate his 
notion of ending the salmon wars for his constituencies. And that would probably have to be part of any proposal that, that he would allow to go forward with his name on it. Obviously, he's not going to do something that's not in his constituency's best interest. But that might mean that this proposal um, doesn't touch all corners of the region in the same way. There might be customized components of it that make sense for the different parts of the Northwest, the different user groups on both sides of this issue across the Northwest. So we'll not know the answer to that until people get together and actually start trying to, to hammer out an agreement that meets everyone's needs. So I think Simpson's put out his vision um, and he's put out things that he says he needs to have. These are non-negotiable things from his perspective for his constituents, but I'm not interpreting that to mean that it's his way or the highway and the whole thing goes or none of it goes. So I think that there's room for flexibility to customize it for people's needs. So we did see uh, a couple of weeks ago, uh, a group of conservation organizations, many of which Advocates for the West represents, sending a letter to um, senators in, I believe, Oregon and Washington, den denouncing Simpson's plan because of the litigation moratorium and those issues you mentioned. What does it mean for the Willamette or coastal communities or whatever? It's one thing for Idaho salmon and steelhead to be saved by removing the lower Snake River dams. And I really do believe that taking out the dams is the critical solution or Idaho salmon and steelhead are going to go extinct, but it doesn't address the rest of, of, the, of, the, of, the, of the stocks throughout the Pacific Northwest. Um, and um, so I, I understand that many groups are voicing opposition to that part of it. The letter that they sent was framed in terms of Simpson's proposal being a non-starter, not entering into the kind of dialogue that you were saying is needed. Is that a damaging sign? Is that a discouraging sign? Uh, what, what can we all do to try to foster more dialogue? Because I, I take it, this is Simpson's proposal. This is not written up. This is not done yet. There's back and forth. There needs to be negotiation and there needs to be compromise, but let's get some major good things out of it if we can. So how can we, do you think, Justin, talk with our friends and, and find uh, for a not just these kind of Zoom calls where we really can hash out some of these issues. Um, I think this is a really important part of the discussion actually. And I think that the concerns that have been raised that, that my organization has raised, that others have raised and that these uh, other groups put together in a letter. I think that those are concerns that need to be taken pretty seriously. Um, and I think that um, it's a challenge to see something that, um, implicates your interests and is pretty short on details that maybe uh, you weren't a part of helping create or maybe you didn't realize was going to be the come out the way that that it did you know when you speak to 300 groups across the region like Simpson did many of those downstream groups were in some way part of that discussion either directly or indirectly and then you see this proposal and you're like whoa I didn't realize that's what it was going to be like um, so I, I think that their concerns need to be taken pretty seriously um, and they need to be invited into the discussion. And one of the ways I think to ensure that concerns are, are taken seriously is for them. Uh, many of those groups were from Oregon and they're represented by uh, you know, Democrat members of Congress and they have probably have better access to the Democrat offices and the Republican offices is to bring those Democrats with them into these discussions and say, hey, Congressman Simpson, we like your proposal to you know, do water quality and save salmon and invest in clean energy, but let's talk about the specifics. So there's that. I think the answer is it's a non-starter is not a very good way of framing that discussion. Uh, so that was unfortunate that they took that approach, but they should uh, come to this discussion with their ideas and concerns, because I think that those are pretty important voices for people to be listening to. Um, I will say too, though, that one of the things that the Simpson office has said to me uh, when I look at this thing and sort of, you know, point out things that I don't like that other components, they've said, uh, look at the things that address your interests. Don't worry so much about the things that, that address somebody else's interests. As long as your interests are being attended to, that's what you should be concerned about, Justin. And so, uh, you know, we are pretty outcome oriented at the Idaho Conservation League. And I wanna see water quality restored and protected across the region. And I suspect that those other groups that signed that letter are also very concerned about water quality and want to do whatever they can to ensure that water quality is restored and protected in, in the part of the states that they work in. And so 
is it not the case that, you know, $800 million of funding for the Columbia or $300 million of funding for water quality work with ag uh, in the Willamette would address some of the concerns that, that they feel like they have to have access to that litigation to in this moment to, to advance their interests. What if their interests could be advanced uh, without the litigation need? Would they accept that? I don't know. I think that's an interesting discussion to have. Can you, can, can you, can, can people rally around the desired outcome as opposed to hanging on to the path that they thought that they were going to use to get to it? So if you're focused on clean water and this proposal delivers clean water, does that meet your needs? Or do you wanna be involved in um, some other means, whether it's litigation or some other collaborative process in your basin that, that this doesn't account for? I don't know, it's an interesting question. It'll just be interesting to see how groups react to it. It, it does seem to me that a, a huge amount will depend on how, for instance, uh, senators Murray and Cantwell respond to this, and Oregon senators as well, the governors, of course. We know that the uh, Puget Sound Orca um, are, are also suffering because of the lack of, of salmon coming out of, out of Idaho. Snake River salmon are an important part of their diet. It is a regional issue. It goes all the way from Idaho to the ocean. How, you know, uh, it, it, and one of the questions we have is, is Simpson's proposal addressing ocean harvest or other kinds of harvest. And, and, and again, to turn back to the politics, so I know I keep keeping with multiple questions. Um, when, how, where can we get some buy-in from the Oregon and Washington congressional delegations to actually have a dialogue with those conservation groups that wrote them the letter opposing this, to have a dialogue with with other folks across the aisle, Eastern, uh, Eastern Washington representatives tend to be Republican. The whole region is affected by this. How does that dialogue start outside of Idaho downstream? How do we get that going downstream? And, and will that, is that happening and will it happen? I think that the Simpson proposal has really fundamentally changed this discussion in the Pacific Northwest. So it's happening. It's not happening in a very formalized way though. And you know, some people like informal processes um, and kind of one-offs and you know, shuttle diplomacy and other people like a big collaborative. Um, and it's an interesting sort of way to think about how those two different um, approaches have both been used in Idaho at different times by different members of Congress. So uh, you know, Congressman Crapo championed uh, protecting the Owyhees through uh, the Owyhee Initiative and the large wilderness areas down there by having a, a large multi-party, multi-year collaborative. And Congressman Simpson protected the Boulder White Clouds by not actually ever having a big collaborative where people sat around a table uh, and hammered it out. His office practiced more of a shuttle diplomacy style. And I think that frame, that, that, that way of doing business, if you will, uh, is, is apparent in this proposal. And you know, we, we'll see how this advances. I do think that in order to you know, draft that text that takes this from proposal to legislation that gets regional buy-in, uh, there's going to have to be a lot more people in that discussion. And there's going to be people who need to lead that, members of Congress and the governors of the states uh, and the tribes will play a significant role in that. And how ideas are, uh, you know, are discussed in the region to larger interest groups and stuff, there's really no form or venue for that in this moment. And I think that's causing a lot of people to have some unease um, because they don't know where they can go to, to look out for their interests. And they're worried that something could happen while they're not at the table. So we're right at seven o'clock now. Um, I think it's a really interesting discussion. I'd like to keep talking for a few minutes if you have a little more time, but we realize people may drop off. You got another 10 minutes or so to keep talking, Justin? I, I do. And I've sort of just been listening yeah. to your questions and stuff, but I've been seeing the chat sort of blow up with a couple of questions. And, right. and I, I wonder if we could just sort of maybe turn the question to the chat for a second and really make sure we just, you know, like speed date our way through the chat questions and sort of see if we can answer some of these quick things. Um, that's, that's what so, I was so going to get at as well. And, uh, and I want to just say one thing before you get going on this, I'm going to give you a second to take a breath. I want to provide a, a personal observation, which is I've been a public interest environmental lawyer now for almost 30 years. 
And part of this career, you know, it, it's always in court. We enforce the environmental laws and we um, try to solve on the ground problems. And what I found over and over again is that litigation itself rarely actually solves the problem. Litigation creates a crisis. Litigation creates some way to change the status quo. Litigation changes the uh, perception of costs and benefits by different parties so that it, it can affect mining, logging, uh, road building, livestock grazing, water diversions, what have you. The enforcement of federal laws in federal court is an important tool in the conservation movement, but it's only one tool. And the long-term solutions tend to come from outside of courts. And, and I have seen, I spent about 10 years working on water flows in the middle Rio Grande in New Mexico, uh, using the, an endangered species, the Rio Grande silvery minnow. And we were making a lot of progress legally in forcing federal agencies to keep water in the river for the, for the fish. And, and we got hit with a political rider, Senator Pete Domenici at the time, powerful Senator, ran through a rider through Congress, which, uh, which, which gave the middle Rio Grande basically an out from the Endangered Species Act. And he, he tried to pretend there was some money flowing to help the minnow and all of that, but there was no negotiation over it. It was rammed down our throats. And I learned from that, that if your litigation gets too far out ahead of the politics, you can suffer losses. And so when I look at Simpson's proposal, what I see is not an attempt to ram a solution down everybody's throat uh, by changing the law, but instead to look at long-term structural solutions and throw a lot of money at it. It's not that much money, but it is a lot of money. And I know those numbers, the 33 billion are based on not pulling things out of the sky, but looking at actual costs to replace the irrigation system at Ice Harbor or what have you. And so I know those are real numbers and they're big numbers. Um, and, and I just wanna say that the, the notion of a litigation moratorium, amending laws, yeah, that bothers me. What will that do for advocates for the West work? But I know clever lawyers can always find ways to reinterpret, sidestep, find another path, go this way, uh, launch a different approach. Um, I, I gotta say that I think it's gonna be very hard to draft language to provide real litigation protection over the long term. Maybe I shouldn't say this aloud. I think some of our colleagues who are very worried about this maybe underestimate the ability of clever lawyers to regroup and find different ways to go at it. There certainly will be a lot of devil in the details of writing up the language. I would like to participate or review that language, but we haven't gotten there yet. But I'm just pointing out that I think Simpson's approach to a regional problem by looking to uh, involve all of the regional players and to look for real solutions, it, it, it deserves our, our applause, at least for that. So I, I just wanted to make that comment. So that gave you a second to look through the questions, Justin, and, and, uh, and, and figure out where you want to go next. Uh, I was actually listening really carefully to what you were saying. <laughs> um, I, 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 see, I see there's a question in here that I think it says, uh, follow the money. You know, who does this help? Uh, who's being taken care of? Uh, I think. As Simpson said, uh, he's restoring salmon, he's protecting water quality, and he's ensuring that communities and interests are, are, are not made worse off by this and are, and are made better off. And some of those things cost more money than others. Uh, you know, quite frankly, 16 billion for renewable energy is a lot of money, but it's for carbon free renewable energy, which I support and is definitely part of the Northwest uh, addressing climate change. Uh, someone else mentioned something in here in the chat about uh, clean energy and the time it would take and uh, the notion of firm versus intermittent. Um, there are scant details in the Simpson proposal. Um, and, you know, I saw something from the Bonneville Power Administration the other day. It was a, it was a section of an article that had been written. I think it was in the spokesman review. Uh, and I'll not get the numbers exactly right, and I'm sorry for that, but BPA said that they thought that they needed about 300 megawatts of firm and about 1900 megawatts of intermittent distributed across the region in the appropriate way and connected by uh, transmission lines to fully mitigate for the loss of the four lower Snake River dams. Um, and, and so I think that, you know, Congressman Simpson is signaling strongly that he wants to see firm dispatchable power created uh, to replace the loss of the, the removal of the dams. But I, I don't, I'm not aware if he has said, 
you know, the exact number that I think has to be firm is, you know, 2000 megawatts or 3000 megawatts or something like that. I think he is signaling though that uh, utilities are telling him that they want to ensure that under any circumstances, the energy of the system is replaced in a way that allows us to have access reliably to affordable energy to meet the region's needs, whether that's a cold snap in the winter or a peak in the summer around you know, air conditioning demand on a day with no wind in the gorge or something. So I think his proposal is, is pretty comprehensive, but the lack of details in here are both a cause for consternation and a sign of flexibility, I think. Uh, so I hope that addresses those, those sorts of questions. Uh, there's another question in here about um, if the dams come out by 2030, will the fish make it that long? Um, I think that they will. Uh, they're in decline, obviously. They're uh, you know, very low numbers. Uh, as they get lower, the situation will become more desperate. Uh, you know, eight years from now, nine years from now, sort of depending on when you start counting, you know, that's three or four uh, life cycles for some stocks of fish, less for others. Uh, I think that we have seen that, like for instance, the sockeye program, sockeye have been kept on life support through truly Herculean efforts at very depressed population numbers. I don't think that salmon will be extinct in 10 years. I think that they will continue to decline and that decline will become harder and harder to reverse. The 10 year number I don't believe was created because that's a magic number for fish. I think the 10 year number was created because it was thought to be the necessary number of years to get the region's infrastructure in place so that the region would allow the dams to be removed, whether that's through uh, you know, rail or renewable energy and stuff. So there's uh, you know, a convergence of biological needs and urgencies and economic system needs and urgencies and infrastructure, uh, just the timing of doing and building certain things. If it were up to me, these would be different timelines. I would have different priorities in this proposal. It's not my proposal, it's the Simpson proposal. Um, so I look forward to this advancing in some form. I also look forward to it being improved uh, for all parties' interests because I think there's room for improvement in this and things that haven't been thought of yet that can be done. And the um, comment just came in from Elaine French about how Mike Simpson will need to will need to be traded. This is a this is going to be national legislation, not just the Pacific Northwest. What what can he emphasize? Uh, components of this plan that have value outside the Pacific Northwest and, and specifically mentioning the methane digester and battery storage. Is yeah. there a sense that, you know, Raul Grijalva, uh, uh, Sheldon Whitehouse, I mean, people across the nation who care about these issues, are they seeing this as a platform to kind of jump on and things that they could support, do you think? I, I think that, um, to the degree that something like this proposal is part of a fast moving infrastructure package that has other things addressing other needs from all across the region all bundled together and 33.5 billion is just a fraction of a percent of something that's much, much bigger. I don't think that you will see sort of the need for horse trading, particularly because I think members of Congress from other regions will be all advancing their own things. And I think to the degree that this becomes a standalone bill, it will get a lot more national scrutiny. Um, so I think, um, you know, whether it's an environmental proposal or an infrastructure proposal or a funding proposal from the Midwest or, you know, the central part of our country, if they're all packed in together, I think members of Congress will be attending to their own needs and not throwing stones and glass houses towards everyone else's stuff. So there's some value and urgency, I think, in trying to be part of a larger infrastructure package. Um, and if that happens, great. And if it doesn't happen and it goes a standalone route, I think that there will be more scrutiny and there will be a need for the Simpson office to highlight some of the things that have uh, you know, more, more national significance like battery storage research and things like that, like, like Elaine points out. I think that's a good point. I, feel I think it's, actually really important for uh, people, normal human beings, uh, my dad, my sister, my friends, to pick up the phone and call their member of Congress and call other members of Congress, call the Washington Democrats that don't seem to be moving, call the Oregon Democrats, 
write letters, uh, you know, participate in the advocacy that organizations like mine make available to you uh, in pretty straightforward ways. You can log on to our website. You can learn more about this issue. You can decide to write letters to the editor. You can decide to write letters to your member of Congress. You can take the easy route and you can click buttons and make it happen sort of automated. And that's helpful, but it's much more meaningful to make personal contacts with people. Uh, it's not lost on members of Congress when they receive letters in the mail or when they receive phone calls. They know that that shows more commitment from the person who is contacting them than clicking a button and sending an automated email. If you only have a moment, click a button and send an automated email. If you've got a little bit more time and more interest in this issue, uh, sit down and write a letter. You can repurpose the same letter to every member of Congress, uh, but it's sending it with a stamp means a lot more than clicking a button on email. Well, I just want to thank everybody. I think we have gone on past our time. I think we could talk about this all night. And if we were at Wild Idaho, we probably would. I am sorry that uh, we're probably not going to be able to gather at Wild Idaho again this year. Is that right, Justin? That's right. The Idaho Conservation League is not going to be having our traditional Wild Idaho conference at Redfish Lake. Uh, COVID has just made that so that's not a really great idea, even though vaccines are, are are, are making their way through it's things are going well but we must not let our guard down and we did not think it would be a good idea to encourage you know 150 people to pack into the dining room at redfish uh, we're going to do something virtually uh this year again like we did last year um i think that was well attended and well received it's not the same as meeting in person and i really am sorry we won't be able to do that but uh, we'll find ways throughout the fall as it's safer to get together to do that in person well, I know that you personally and Idaho Conservation League as an organization are investing a ton of time and resources in this. This is really in, in many ways. And I know you have many other priorities and things you're continuing to work on. Advocates for the West works with Idaho Conservation League on many areas of public lands, water, fish and wildlife issues. And we're continuing to do so when we represent ICL in various court cases. If, if this proposal were to become law and there was gonna be some moratorium and language pre preventing lawsuits is not going to end the partnership between ICL and Advocates for the West because there's going to still be a lot to work on. I'm not worried about, about that. I would love to see that day come. I do think that everyone here on the call, we really appreciate your, your interest and your participation, your support. Another way you can support this effort is to make a donation to Idaho Conservation League or to Advocates for the West. We are not squarely in the middle of all the litigation over the Lower Snake River dams, but we are involved in a variety of efforts dealing with habitat in Idaho, with water flows, with BPA and so forth. And, uh, you know, again, I would welcome the day that, that we might be precluded from bringing some litigation because the Lower Snake River dams are going out and billions of dollars are going to renewable energy and to clean up water in the Snake River Plain and other places. But we, there's gonna be a lot to do to get there. And uh, thanks for taking the time with us, Justin, to, to, to help us. Thank you. Understand it. Laird, if, just as I close out, yeah. I could give sort of a, a shout out to the work that Advocates has done, uh, not only on salmon and steelhead and water quality and so many things across Idaho and the entire West. Uh, you know, you've got offices in Idaho and in Oregon and just, all kinds of incredible things being done. This issue has really been advanced through time by so many organizations. Um, you know, our partners in this with, you know, Idaho Rivers United, Idaho uh, Wildlife Federation, Conservation Voters for Idaho, Trout Unlimited, um, you know, the Nez Perce tribe, the Shoshone Bannock tribe, the Shoshone Paiute tribe, tribes across the region. Uh, this is uh, such an incredible and big issue that were it not for all of the people working together, even when we're not always in agreement with all the details, people have been uh, pointing in the right direction and swimming together as a pack to try and get something done for salmon and steelhead for so long. And so, you know, staff who have started at these organizations and board members who are at these organizations and aren't, aren't on staff or aren't on the board anymore, um, this moment has come about because of the work of literally thousands of committed supporters, uh, staff of organizations, board members, just the rank and file members and supporters of these organizations. This is an incredible time uh, and much has been accomplished, but there is so much more to do before we get this over the finish line. So just like with COVID, we can't let our guard down with this issue. This is far from resolved and we can't let our guard down now in this moment either.
Awesome. Thank you both. Thank you, Justin. Thank you, Laird. Thank you, everyone, for attending. Um, I'll just reiterate, this will be on our YouTube channel recorded. And if you had a question that didn't get answered, please feel free to email that account's email address that came with your confirmation, and we can settle it over email. But thank you all so much. And thank you, Justin, and thank you, Laird. Thank you, Natalie. Thanks, Justin. Thank you, everybody. Bye-bye.